In the introductory lecture for mechanics and materials, I defined solid mechanics as the study of the behavior of solid material bodies that are subjected to imposed loading and or displacement. And when I said the word behavior, I told you that it would be stresses and strains that we were considering. Well, today we're going to learn about one, the first of those, which is stress. We'll also be talking about equilibrium, which is one of the three pillars of solid mechanics and is an important concept for us to understand before moving into stress. After watching this video, students should be able to identify body forces, surface forces, and internal forces, compute normal and planar internal force components, define normal and shear stress, and compute average normal and average shear stresses. The very first concept that we need to remember is that all of our external loads must be in equilibrium. So when we look at a body, for example, the one shown on this screen, we have two different types of applied loads. In blue, on the outside of the body, those are what are called surface forces. So here, here, and here. These are forces that are caused by contact of bodies acting over an area. So we have forces acting on the surface of an object. And then in the middle, I have a downward arrow, W, to indicate the weight of the object. That would be considered a body force. A body force is any force that acts over the volume of an object. So typically, in this class, it's gravity. Uh, but theoretically, it could also be an electromagnetic force as well. When we have these surface forces and body forces applied, they must be in equilibrium, which means we must have reactionary forces to put this overall body into equilibrium. And more specifically, when we talk about equilibrium, we're talking about the sum of the forces in all directions that would be the x, y, and z directions, and the sum of the moments about all axes. So the moments about the x, y, and the z axes all must equal zero. And if we slice the body in half, the resulting two pieces must also be in force and moment equilibrium. So that means if we were to draw just the left half of this object, and now it has a pl in internal plane exposed, we can look at, or we will see that there are now forces acting on that plane. And the magnitude and direction of those forces is going to be dependent on what other forces are acting on this body. If we look at that same area, cross-sectional area, so an internal surface, and I told you that there was forces acting on it. Those are what we call resultant forces. They're the resultant of whatever the applied forces are on that object. And if we look at a little tiny square, delta A, on that body, let me blow that up to be bigger. Give it some coordinate directions where these two are in the direction of the plane. So these are normal, oops, sorry, not normal. Those are tangential to the plane. And this one here is normal. So if we look at that little delta A, delta A, 
it has a force some in acting in some direction, some resultant force. And that resultant force can be broke up, broken up into force components. We can look at the component that is acting in the neutral direction, sorry, the normal direction. Delta F sub N. And we can look at the component that is acting in the tangential direction, delta F sub T. And the two of those components added together as vectors must equal the resultant vector. The magnitudes of those resultants, I'm sorry, the magnitude of those components is taken as the resultant force vector times either the cosine or the sine of an angle theta n, where theta n is the angle between the applied, or rather the resultant internal force, and the normal or perpendicular direction to that plane. These components, delta Fn and delta Ft, normal and tangential, depend on not only the location of point P, so in this case, point P is here. If we move to a new location, point P prime over here, we would get different components, assuming that the resultant were different. The stress may not, or the force may not be the same acting on every little incremental area. So if we have a different delta F over here, if we have del delta F prime, different magnitude, then it would follow that we would get different components. Also, if the orientation of the section plane is different. So if instead of having a vertical cut through that member like we did on the previous slide, if we had had an inclined cut like so, we would end up even at the same location P, we would end up with different components because it's a different direction now. So now that we've talked about forces and equilibrium, we can move into the concept of stress. Stress is a measure of force intensity, which means that it's a normalized force or a force per unit area. And it's independent of the size and shape of the body. That's the beauty of normalizing it, is we can compare a very small specimen to a very large specimen in terms of its behavior and because we've normalized the forces applied by the cross-sectional area, we can be comparing to similar, similar situations. If we look at the definition of stress, we have two different variables that we use. We use sigma and tau. Sigma always refers to a normal stress, which is caused by a force that is normal or perpendicular to a surface. Tau is what we call a shear stress. That's a stress that is caused by a force that is tangential or in the plane of, of a given surface. So the def formal definition of normal of these, these normal stresses and shear stresses are the limit as the area you're considering goes to zero of the force divided by the area, with the only difference being whether you use the normal force or the tangential force. And note that these stress values are scalar values. They're not vectors. The forces themselves are vectors, but the stress is a scalar value. If oh, let me come back here. One more thing I want to point out. 
the use of the subscript n here in both cases is to indicate that the plane has a normal direction that is in the n direction. So we might substitute, say, x, y, or z for that variable n, depending on which direction is normal to our surface. Now, if these normal and shear stresses are constant across the surface, then we can start talking about an average stress value. So if, for example, we have this internal surface that has a resultant force on it and we break it up to small areas and each one of these is a delta A and let's say each one of those has the same delta F. Now let's make that, make it, they each have the same delta F normal and delta F tangential. Then when we integrate over the entire cross section, We're integrating the normal force and we're integrating stress dA because remember I said stress is delta F over delta A. So in order to integrate that, we moved delta A to the other side of the equation and then we integrated both sides and we come out with that the normal force acting over the entire cross section is just that constant normal stress times the area. So we can say that if we want an average value then, it's going to be the total force acting normal to the cross section divided by the area. And so even if the force is not completely uniform, if we use this formula, it will give us an average value. And furthermore, if instead of referencing the normal component, we want this formula to reference the actual force, which might say be in this direction, we use the force cosine theta n equation, recalling that this angle here is theta n. And similarly for the shear stress direction, we integrate the shear equation to get that the tangential force is equal to, ah, my apologies, this should be a tau, it's equal to tau times a, therefore tau average is going to be equal to the force in the tangential direction divided by, or not, not the delta force, but the overall force in the tangential direction divided by the area. And we know that that tangential force is the overall force times sine theta n. So before we conclude, I just want to make this last point that these equations are for average stress values, which we will be using extensively in this class, but the true definition of stress comes back, to, comes back to these limits. And I think it's important for you to internalize the difference. That in this class, we're talking largely about average values, but if you want to know the actual stress at a point, you would need the limit of that incrementally tiny force acting on an infinitesimally small element of area. Please be sure to watch the next video where we talk about the 3D stress component.